Hello, welcome to jasonnewland.com. My name is Jason Newland and this is Relaxation Hypnosis for Stress, Anxiety and Panic Attacks. Please only listen when you can safely close your eyes. Please uh, subscribe to this podcast, uh, that way you'll be notified when a new one arrives, which at the moment is pretty much every day. Also, if you'd like to uh, leave a review, please go to my website. Uh, you can leave a video review if, you, if you're feeling brave uh, to let me know how you feel and if this podcast has been useful. And also, if you'd like to help support this free service, help towards running costs, um, then please go to paypal.me forward slash Jason Newland or go to the website and there's a gift me page on there, a link. So, there's a couple of things. I've always got, always got ideas about what I'm going to talk about. I've got a few ideas. I've not always uh, kind of just got one thing that I want to discuss or talk about, unless it's going to be an actual exercise. But this isn't going to be an exercise. This is going to be me, I can say wobbling on, but waffling on. I don't know, just me talking. And well, I, I, I'm not quite sure how to um, approach this. But the main thing, the main point that I want to get across is for you to to actually I guess self-esteem it's, it's called self-esteem that's what the normal kind of term would be to get in touch and to build up your own self-esteem I probably use the word self-worth Personally, that seems more like a, I don't know, it seems more of an apt word. Um, but they're both obviously important and it's pretty much the same thing. But self-worth, let's, let's focus on self-worth. And you may think, well, that's, what's that got to do with the price of cheese? You know, what's they got to do with stress and anxiety? It might have nothing to do with your situation. It might have everything to do with your situation. It might mildly have, you know, something to do with it. Because let's face it, some people are going through a extremely stressful and anxiety and anxious time because their partner is ill or their child is ill seriously ill or you know uh, parent brother sister best friend so anxiety and stress doesn't you know it's not confined to just something that's happening to us because someone else being ill is not happening to us or that feels like it but it's not it's happening to them but we're being affected by it because we love that person so this is not aimed so that in this situation maybe someone might have great self-esteem self-belief self-worth but actually um, it's more stress reduction uh, coping skills that are required so maybe this recording might not be useful I don't know to everybody but not every recording is going to be is it apart from those that are but I like the idea that everything has it worth everything has you know I can read a book and there might be just one sentence in the entire book 
that resonates with me and actually changes the way I think. And it keeps repeating. You know, it's, it's like, like a spicy curry, you know, <laughs> it's repeating on you. It's like, I keep tasting it. I, I ate it like six hours ago and I'm still tasting it. And it could be like that, you know, you hear a sentence, you know, uh, for example, someone said to me the idea that actually being told that I've helped other people and I may never be aware of it. I've helped people that I don't know I've helped. Really resonated with someone late, you know, recently. Uh, so it's, it's sometimes just a little, a little idea, or a big idea, depending on how effective it is to the individual person. But coming back to self-worth, self-worth. What is self-worth? Break it down. It's is it feeling worthy? Worthy. Why do we need to feel worthy? Or is it feeling that you're worth something? And personally, we are priceless. You can't put a value on a human being. You can't really put a value on any any life. We were, you know, so we are. I was going to say worthless. Then we are priceless. So the word worth isn't really, in a sense, from a positive perspective, is not valid. But from the negative perspective of how people might feel, because a lot of people will feel worthless, then, you know, is kind of looking at it from that angle. Instead of feeling priceless, they feel worthless when we are all priceless. We cannot be replaced. Nobody can be replaced. We all have our own unique view of the world, our stance, our opinions, our thoughts, the way we look, the way we walk, the way we, the, the way we taste food may be different to other people sense of humour, all kinds of different things. And a lot of that stuff is hidden. Because there's a big... There's pressure to conform. You know, if like if you see someone from, a, let's say, a part of this country, I'm not going to say which part, because it could be any part, but you find someone from a specific part of the country and they go to another part of the country and they will act the stereotypical, be stereotypical to what everyone thinks that they're, those people, those people act like when it's not real. Because they're just human beings and they take on behaviors from other people and we all do, that's how we learn. But inside, they're an individual. Some people don't come across as being very individual because maybe they're not, they don't feel confident enough within themselves. I remember my friend said to me, I'm unique, I'm a unique individual, just like all my friends. So it's kind of that pressure to conform. I kind of don't feel that pressure, but it definitely gets easier with age because it doesn't matter anymore. But there is that pressure. I mean, I think when you're younger, you know, it's when I was maybe in my twenties, I still didn't conform, but I definitely noticed the pressure to do so, to wear the certain kind of clothes and to have a certain kind of haircut and to even the you know, to date certain types of people. Sort of to keep in your own lane, into your own little group. And because I've never had groups, 
I didn't kind of conform to that. And it throws people off. So do you get your self-worth from other people? That's kind of where I'm coming from for this. Because that's where we originally get it from. Our self-esteem comes from others. Our self-worth comes from others. Initially. You think of a little baby. He's just done a done a poo on his potty. But because the whole family's clapping and making such a big deal about it because he's done it on the potty instead of on the table, the dinner table, everyone's happy, he's like, Well done, well done, well done little JJ, well done Andre. And that little that little toddler, little baby, little child thinks this means that I'm worth something. It's not going to think cognitively, logically that way, but emotionally that's going to be the connection. The I'm worth something. And in the same way when a child misbehaves and they get told off or smacked or worse or ostracised by their peers at school or college or teachers or friends because they don't you know act in the, the way that everyone expects them to then they're basing their self worth and self esteem again on the outside from other people and we've all done it we were brought up to do it it's how we're raised and maybe not everyone's raised like that but I'm just I am generalising have to generalise in these situations and some people keep that going throughout the whole life until they stop and realise that actually other people's opinions are not important or not as important as perhaps they used to think they were see I don't care what my dad thinks about me Really, I do, but I don't. But at the same time, you know, I've got to show respect. He's an elderly man. He's my dad. So I, I try and show a little bit of respect. I'm laughing because I'm not sure I always pull it off very well. But I can form when I'm with him to a degree. But I don't conform to his lifestyle or to his thinking when I'm not with him. Because then that would be my self-worth. It wouldn't be my self-esteem, would it? It would be his self his esteem put onto me. Or his values put onto me, not my own values. Yet we share values. He's very against stealing, and I love to steal. No, that's no, that's wrong. No, he's against stealing. I am as well. You know, I, I don't steal. I'm not a thief. It's just one of those things that it's. I don't even feel that it's because I've been taught it. Although it probably is, to be fair. But I can make my own mind up. And I can look at it and think, no, taking someone else's property or belongings is actually pretty much a disgusting thing to do outside of an emergency. But put me in a situation where I've got no food, I will go into a supermarket and I will steal sandwiches and food. I've got no problem with that. So it's a diff. It's a di it's, that's about self worth and self preservation, because actually the person that goes and you know forces themselves to steal something from a supermarket because it's that or starving, then their self esteem is kind of a bit more healthy than if they didn't do it, if they just lie down and didn't do anything to help themselves. 
then that's a sign their self-worth is very, very low. And, but then it's also a sign they need help. So that's another thing, I think, in those situations when people get vulnerable, when we're at our lowest, when we really need help, the self-worth seems to hide. It's, I don't know, it almost feels a little bit like a regression. When I first, when I was having the, the panic attacks, the anxiety back in 2000 and three it was really like a whole pretty much had two years of it really and I had I think I had a couple of weeks off work and I went down to the to the reception because there was a reception for the building I, that I lived in and I said I can't remember what I said something about um I made a flippant comment about Oh, I'm probably going to go and top myself. Something like that. But I was I was down. I was, very, you know, I was depressed and everything. But I didn't really mean it. But I said it as a like a. I suppose in my way maybe a joke. I don't know. It wasn't a very funny joke. But I said it. And then ten minutes later, there's a knock at my door, and the counsellor. They actually, because it was a charity that ran this building. And they had a homeless section to it. I wasn't in that part, but they had a, so they had a counsellor that dealt with homeless people. And I was, they got their money from the flats that they rented. That's how they financed it. Anyway, I just knock on the door and there's a lady there saying, yeah, I'm a counsellor. Um, can I come in? And she sat down and she sort of, sort of said, we just want to check that you're okay. Because I always got on quite well with the people that worked in the reception, say hello to them, and you know, they, yeah, they kind of knew me a little bit. And I just said, no, I'm not. And she, she gave me like a few, a few counseling sessions. And I almost felt like I'd regressed. And I didn't realise that my self-worth was pretty much at a zero. Um, self-respect, I don't think I had any. But so my self-worth was just, I'd almost given up because I couldn't see a way. I didn't see, couldn't figure out how this was going to end, how I was going to be able to move forward from the anxiety because it had overtaken my life. So my, I kind of coming back to the self-worth bit, we need to hold on to that, all of us. We need to nourish it. And sometimes it hides. It hasn't gone away, it hasn't disappeared, it's just hiding. And it's about finding it again. And I think that's what happens with depression. Love, happiness, joy, uh, motivation, positivity, all those things um, that feel like they've disappeared. Like they're, they're dead, like they've died. They haven't, they've just, they're hiding. You think of it like they're hiding because they don't like the environment. They don't want to be in that environment of extreme negativity. It's very hard to live in that environment, to be around it. If you know anyone that's just generally really negative, and I, I've known people and like every third word or sentence that comes out of their mouth is negative. I can't say I always enjoy being with them. It's, it's not an enjoyable experience. I don't mind if it's humorous, but if it's like always constantly, 
uh, everything's negative. Even if they're they're not depressed, they're just negative people. It's hard for happiness or positivity or uh, any kind of motivation to live in that environment. So it doesn't die, it doesn't disappear, it hides. It doesn't run away, it hides. And it waits for when it's safe to come back. It's almost like, you know, a child with both the parents arguing. The child might hide because, let's say, children, I don't think any children like having their parents arguing. Even if it's just a, a verbal exchange which isn't too serious, still unpleasant for the child. And the child would possibly hide, maybe under the bed. Or maybe just in the bedroom until the atmosphere is cleared and then it's kind of emotionally safe to go back so that's what happens I think maybe maybe that's what happens with our self-worth it hides because the environment I mean, we're, we are the parent of our self-worth. We are the parent of our positivity. We are the parent of our motivation. It's our responsibility, individually. They're our children. And it might seem weird, a weird concept, but if you think about it like that, then you get an idea of how precious they are. And these aren't just children that you've had for maybe 10 years. We've had these children our whole life. They've been inside us our whole life. Admittedly, when we're first born, they're not really developed. And maybe they're still not. Maybe they're never fully developed. Because we're always changing, aren't we? But we're the parent. You are the parent of your own happiness, of your own motivation. You're the parent of your own self-worth. You're the parent of your own self-esteem. You're the parent of your own kindness. You're a parent of your own love that you can feel for yourself and others. You're the parent. And it's not like uh, you get to the point, you know, the kid's a teenager and you stop, you stop trying to help because, you know, the teenager's being a pain and then the teenager becomes older and you just let them go on with their life because you kind of have to. You have to take a step back at some point. In this situation, we never have to take a step back because we're always the parent, because they are always our children. They're always dependent upon us. Because if we don't take responsibility for them, then they take it from outside. So self-esteem will take it from what other people do, what other people say, how other people act, how other people treat us. Instead of us actually listening to ourselves and being motivated by what we want to be motivated by. And to enjoy things that we enjoy. Not being blown around in the wind like an old plastic bag that has no direction. Because we're not that. And I'm not, I've got nothing against plastic bags. So, we're our own parent of those emotions, those feelings. We're responsible for our own self-worth to get in touch with those feelings. 
I want to say we're responsible. I don't mean we're to blame. I've got no time for blame. No. No time at all for blame. No time for guilt. Just get rid of those two words. Expel them from the dictionary. They're not useful. Blaming yourself or blaming others. It never leads to any degree of happiness. Blame only leads to... Well, it doesn't lead anywhere, does it? And you could argue, well, what if someone does something? It's, it's not, I'm not going to blame myself. Who do I blame if they did it? They're responsible. They're responsible. It's a different word. If you're in a car and you drive into someone's I don't know, garden, then you're responsible for that. You're not to blame for that. You're responsible for it. It's a different thing. It's a different emotion. In fact, it doesn't really have any emotion. It just means you take responsibility and you do what's needed to be done to rectify the situation. And hopefully, we don't always, but hopefully we'll learn from it. So blaming is of no use. And guilt, come on. Guilt is for people that will never move on. We need to, we need to move on. If something bad happens and we do something that hurts another person or hurts herself, it's really horrible. Of course we're gonna feel crappy. It's natural, that's the natural way of it, things. We're gonna feel awful for uh, some time. You can't let it rule your life. You can't let it be the, the controlling factor to your future and guilt no because people that feel guilty really want other people to feel guilty as well it's like a disease it's like an infection a virus in fact people that feel guilt and welcome guilt they demand other people to feel guilty. So I'd say don't get involved in that at all. Let other people do what they want to do. If someone wants to feel guilty, let them feel guilty. Not your problem. They're just hurting themselves. And they may say, yeah, but it stops me from doing what I did before. Well, I suppose if, if you're a little child or you're, you know, you need to be trained like a puppy to control you. But if you're an adult with a brain, with the ability to think, which you are and you have, then you don't need guilt. You just need the memory. You just need to, you know, you're not going to forget what happened. You don't have to think about it all the time. We're very lucky we've got these brains that remember stuff. So we don't have to think about it. Can you imagine if every night before we went to bed, we had to write down every single thing that we ever thought about and everything that's ever happened in our life so that we can remember it when we wake up. Well, no, we don't have to do that because even though you go to sleep, your mind slows down to practically nothing whilst you're going to sleep. I know there's a lot of stimulation at times during sleep. But you'd, you wake up and all that stuff is still available. So 
So it's not something we have to keep pondering on. It's available when you need it. Don't need huge emotion, negative emotion attached. So what is your self-worth like now? That's the question. What is your self-worth? What would you say is between zero and 10? Zero being absolutely crappy. Like zero, you know, you feel... I don't know, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but if I was a zero of self-worth, I guess I probably wouldn't care about myself at all. I probably, I have beaten zero of self-worth in the past, but it's uh, it's quite difficult to get into that zone. Um, I probably wouldn't care about my health, wouldn't care about my appearance, Although I'm not too bothered about my appearance these days, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel. I'd feel that no one else cared. I'd probably feel that I wasn't worthy. So if I got ill, I wasn't worthy enough. I didn't deserve to have medical attention. Um. Maybe I wouldn't go for a job interview because I didn't feel that I deserved to have that job. Perhaps I would end a relationship with someone that I cared about because I didn't feel worthy, didn't feel that I was worth anything and that they deserved to be with someone better than me. Just basically being almost a zombie I suppose, kind of a zombie, uh, like the living dead at its most extreme. To have zero self-worth is, I don't know why, I just get the image of someone that literally um, would see a lion running at them and wouldn't even bother trying to get away. I just like, no no kind of interest in their own safety which is a terrible terrible place to be or someone with no motivation that really believes the bullshit that's going on in their mind telling them that nothing's ever going to change and everything's going to be crap forever and blah blah blah, blah. and they actually believe it when we all know that that is not true. We don't always know it's not true, obviously. There's times when it feels true. But we're talking about self-worth here. We're not talking about um, depression. Because self-worth is something that, or lack of self-worth, is something that probably lasts for years. It's not like, I don't think it's something that would necessarily... Um, changed dramatically for most people maybe some of bipolar which I have it can I guess it can go to extremes at times and I suppose with some people depending on the situation it can drop and rise but ultimately it's going to even out it's going to even out at a point where it doesn't really ever go beyond doesn't go above or below that point. But it can be improved upon or it can be reduced. I mean, there's lots of things you could do to make yourself feel worse. If you so wanted to, why would you want to? But that's another thing. I quite like the idea of if you get in touch with what you could do to make yourself feel really crappy, then you now know what you could do to make yourself feel really good because it's the opposite and also it proves to you you know that actually you do have control over how you feel because some people say I've got no control over how I feel Uh, it's just how I feel I can't control it okay do you like Marmite? no well eat that Marmite it's like I'll eat it and they'll eat it they're choosing to eat it even though if I said eat it they don't have to so they're eating it, they're feeling horrible, it might be gagging because they think it's so disgusting. 
what could be marmite could be burp could be anything could be banana could be anything that they really don't like eating and uh, then you could say well actually you feel worse now than you did before don't you and I say yeah and when you was eating that marmite you felt way crappier than you did before you started eating that marmite yeah that's that's a truth that's there's no way of denying that so therefore you do have control over how you feel because you just made yourself feel worse so if you can make yourself feel worse you can make yourself feel happier or more relaxed and it gives back the freedom it gives back the control gives back the reality that actually we can have a degree of control about how we feel and when I say control I'm not talking about control in the conventional way of I'm going to make sure that I feel you know this relax at this time and always be monitoring yourself because that would be I don't think it'd be much fun at all that would be for me that would be stressful but always monitoring I've done that in the past monitored how I felt what emotions I was feeling carried around a diary every hour I'd write down sort of what level of stress I was at it can be useful to sort of get an idea of where you are but um, maybe not always sometimes but once you realise you can change it's an old uh, Milton Erickson did a thing where this lady came in he's a he's a psychotherapist and hypnotist from the sort of 50s and 60s uh, 70s and he was very famous a lady came to him and said she was an overweight lady she said I can't change my weight I can't change it nothing I can do can my weight stays this way I can't change it because she wanted to reduce weight and he said are you sure she said yeah um, he said you want to reduce it I said but I can't change it I can't have no way I can't change the weight so he said well here's your homework go home and he weighed her and she was like five thousand pounds or whatever and she said uh, he said come back when you put on uh, 14 pounds she said what he said yeah come back when you put on 14 pounds and I want you to do it in the next two weeks and she did she came back he weighed her she was 14 pounds exactly overweight above the weight she was and he said oh that proves it then doesn't it proves that you were wrong and that you actually can and she said what so it means that you can change your weight and she said yeah but I feel horrible I don't want to be heavy I want to be lighter this is this makes me feel ill I don't like being heavier and she, he said, well, well, now you know you can control your weight. You can reduce it if you want. It's up to you. But you, you've proven to yourself that you can control your weight. And I keep that analogy in my head for various different situations just to remember that actually we do have the ability to make changes even though um, we may be using limiting language like I can't there's no way I can do it it's impossible no 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 and that's another good thing if you can start doing that in your head when you start saying negative things go no 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 you know like when kids put their fingers in their ears and go no 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 to try and block out the the sound of maybe their friend saying something they don't want to hear perhaps start doing it to ourselves when we start hearing 
you know, start saying negative things to ourselves. Because ultimately, when it comes to self-esteem or self-worth, it brings me back to something that I said years and years ago, I said it to clients in the past, is our self-worth is affected by our internal dialogue. Hugely affected. And what we say to ourselves affects how we think and how we feel. It affects how we feel. How could it not? And what we say to ourselves is more powerful than what anybody else could say to us. It has more effect. If you were saying this to yourself, what I'm saying, it have way more effect than me saying it. And in some ways, it is you saying it because you're listening to it on an audio rather than me being in front of you. So it's kind of separated me from it and it's just become part of you, in a sense. Those parts that you find useful, that is. Those parts that you invite into yourself. And you've got this internal dialogue telling yourself stuff that you might not even be aware of and it might be something as uh, yeah I'm not good enough for years and years I've been telling myself I used to tell myself that I was stupid and I was thick that's what I used to tell myself because that's what I was told and I internalised it and I used to think it I really used to believe it. Eventually, I learned that that wasn't the case. But it took many, many, many years. And I'm still not there. I'm still not there. Still not where, you know, I could be. As far as feeling um, confident within myself and my own ability to maybe do certain things, whether academic or... Uh, intellectually possibly so you've got these things that you're thinking about and you might not even be aware of it and that's when it causes the most damage because you stop taking notice of it yet it's still going on making those beliefs stronger those limiting beliefs that are no good and are outdated and harmful they get stronger if you ignore and don't notice what you're saying to yourself inside your mind you might even say it out loud how often have you heard someone say oh I'm crap at that I'm useless at that I'm used they actually they will verbalize externally what their internally their internal kind of thought patterns and how many times have you noticed yourself doing it I've done that loads of times in the past. I said something, and maybe you've not noticed it, but maybe you will now. And it's like, oh, did I really just say that out loud? I've just called myself stupid, or an idiot, or useless. I've just said that out loud. It's like, wow. Sometimes it comes as a little bit of a shock. I don't. Do I really think that about myself? So my analogy is basically, if you, well, first of all, it's bullying. You're basically bullying yourself. And I'm guessing pretty much everyone listening to this finds bullying disgusting. It's a disgusting thing. Um, I'm not even taking a moral judgment, I'm just saying factually it's just disgusting to bully you know it's something that maybe kids will do and they don't realise what they're doing and you know whatever but to bully yourself is uh, a different level and unacceptable 
which I'm sure you agree. Because maybe you've not thought of it that way, not thought of it as in, I've been bullying myself, telling myself that I'm stupid, that I'm not worth anything, that, or not worth enough, that I don't deserve to be with my partner, or that um, I don't deserve to be loved, or whatever horrible things, negative lies that we tell, that we tell ourselves. Although lies is probably a strong word because at the time we probably do believe it, but it's not true. So whatever the middle ground is between lies and being true, because that's not true when we say that stuff to ourselves. So maybe we are lying to ourselves. But there's definitely bullying going on there. And that's unacceptable. And then remember, go back to the fact that you're the parent of those parts of yourself, self-worth, uh, the love, self-love, kindness, positivity, motivation, those things that hide sometimes because they feel they're being bullied. They're bullied away by the big bully that's being negative because negativity is powerful stuff. I mean, you know, I've met nice people and I've met people that are really perhaps not so nice. But, you know, in a fight, in a really dangerous situation, I felt I'd rather have the really mean person with me to defend me because they'd probably physically be able to do it and they'd be able to mentally do it. The nicest person in the world may not be able to do anything but they're lovely to be around but they keep away from that stuff. They don't want anything to do with negativity or hostility. So they hide which is kind of the natural thing to do really. So as a parent, you're the parent of those, those parts of you. They rely on you. You're their parent. You always will be. You're responsible for them. You can ignore them if you want. You don't have to do anything, of course. But you are responsible. So if you allow them to nurture and you give them time to nurture and you give them time to be there and give them space get rid of that negative stuff then they're allowed they're allowed to grow and to blossom and just if you think about it in a sense of a garden if you let, if you let the weeds the weeds will destroy everything that they can get rid of the weeds and the garden changes it's a different environment it's flowers and the plants it's, you know, it's a different, totally different sometimes you need to get rid of the weeds but if you look at it, in it I like to go to the extremes sometimes if you look at it from an extreme perspective, from a real um, quite a horrible perspective really, in the sense of if you had somebody following you around, saying to you the things that you say to yourself, would you be able to put up with it? And some people might say, well, I had that in the past. So I'm not talking about as a child or, you know, as an adult, I'm hoping that no one has to put up with that. Uh, and if if you are doing going through that stuff, seek help. Genuinely seek help, like now. Straight away, and put an end. Make sure that stops, and make sure that you're safe. 
So if you've got someone walking around following you, saying all the things that you say to yourself in your mind, putting yourself down, telling yourself you're not good enough, nah, 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 all that stuff, you're not, at the very least, you're not going to want to be around them. I mean, you'd want to hide from them, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you want to hide from that person? They'd knock on your door in the morning. You wouldn't answer the door, would you? They'd phone you up. You'd see their, their name on the phone. No, thank you very much. You'd keep away from them. So why do we allow it in our heads? Why do we allow ourselves to do it to ourselves? And also, I go from one other angle as well. I'll just say one one sentence really. And I've done recordings on this in the past. You think about what you say to yourself. My question is this. Would you say that to a small child? So whatever you just said to yourself, whether it's I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, uh, I don't deserve to be happy, all those kind of stuff that's wrong, that you know, makes no sense really. Would you say that to a small child? someone that you care for like your own child or your niece nephew your grandchild even even a child you don't even know would you walk up to a child in the street um apart from the fact that you'd get in trouble especially if the parents were there and they heard you say it but if you would go up to a child and say those things that you say to yourself would you say that to a small child now I'm guessing the answer would be 100% no. If it's yes, then again, maybe seek some professional help and work through that. But I say most people would say no to that. You wouldn't be abusive verbally the way you are to yourself or have been in the past or used to be before you decided to change and they've heard this. And... You've got this, that situation, it's like, no, you wouldn't. I wouldn't, you wouldn't. Of course you wouldn't. It's actually, it's almost insulting to be asked that, isn't it? Of course I wouldn't do that. That's, that's a disgusting thing. Wouldn't hurt a small child. So if it's not good enough for the child, why is it good enough for you? That that type of language, that type of put downs, negativity. If it's not okay for a small child, why is it okay for you? Why is that why? I mean, that's that child that you never, maybe you've never seen before. You go up to them, yeah, you might get in trouble, but ultimately you're not going to have to see them again. Not part of their life. But you still wouldn't, would you? Even if you knew you'd never have to see the person again, you wouldn't do it because you know that it'd be really, really upsetting to the child. Yeah, it's okay for us to do it to ourselves constantly, Day in, day out. No. How can it be? No. So that would be probably what I would ask you to do next time you say something to yourself, or maybe you say it out loud. You know, maybe you bash your toe on a, on a chair and you say, oh, I'm such a clumsy so-and-so. And then actually, wait a minute. Would you say that to a small child who just hurt themselves? Someone that you really cared about? Would you call them an idiot for uh, tripping over?
would you call them weak for not being able to um, deal with something no you wouldn't would you because that grandchild that child the you know whoever it, that that little boy or girl is you wouldn't want to hurt them you wouldn't want to upset them so my question really is from now on just just it's going to stick in your mind but anyway but if if from now on just the next couple of days find yourself notice yourself when you're being negative towards yourself and this can have a big effect on stress levels because it's hard enough to go through a difficult time whether it's ill health or whatever but to be blaming yourself and having a go at yourself for being ill which a lot of people will do it's it's definitely not going to make it better so the next time or however many times it happens over the next few days I just recommend that you stop yourself notice it when you notice it stop and say okay that sentence would I say that to a small child and if the answer is no let it go if the answer is no let it go let that thought evaporate let that thought be disintegrated it's not welcome just in the same way as you know if you've got you've got a small child and a neighbour or someone from school comes round and that kid starts getting really rough with your child that's going to be the end of the little date isn't it play date's over go away we're going to call the parents or wait till the parents get here and say okay see ya probably not going to want that child back in your home again if that child was hurting your child and probably tell maybe tell the parents what happened maybe I don't know but some things are not acceptable are they and some things shouldn't be acceptable to any of us but we're the only ones that can make that decision so I'm going to ask you the next time you have a thought in your mind where you're putting yourself down where you're saying something horrible to yourself calling yourself names saying I'm useless I'm, there's no point in me doing this I'm bleh, bleh, whatever it might be just ask yourself would I say that to a small child if the answer is no then why why say it to yourself then aren't you as important as a small child why would a small child be more important than you why would you deserve to be having that verbal abuse but a small child doesn't the answer is neither of you do neither of you deserve it so that's it so I'm going to maybe I should just call this recording would you say that to a small child and or self worth I don't know but that's it just, just go with that and maybe let me know how you get on so thank you for listening remember to be kind to yourself And notice how your stress levels have reduced since you've been listening to me. 
So let's take care and uh, I'll speak to you next time. Probably tomorrow. Lots of love. Bye.